Hey guys, it's me, Landry Jones, and today we're going to talk about the burning bush. Do I look like Moses, right? I kind of look like him, right? But he does have a beard, but not me. When I grow up, I will. I should talk about it, right? Okay, so, um, uh, Moses was walking with his sheep, and he saw something blow up. Guys, do you think you know what it is? Well, let's think. Oh, yeah, I know. I know it so much. Burning bush? Let's see. And then he walked over there, and it was a burning bush. So I was right. Champion. <laughs> That's funny. Ah, but the bush was not burning up. Guys, do you think you know who's in the bush? Hey, let's, 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 uh, say, let's think it with me, okay? Hmm. Do you think you know what it is, guys? It's sure. I think I'm sure. I think it's the, I think it's Jesus, because he's always everywhere. So he goes up to the bush, and then it says to take your sandals off, because you're walking on holy ground. And then he said, what if they won't believe me? And then he said, I have two signs for you. Those balloons everywhere. I think someone likes it. Why's those balloons everywhere? Yay! What does that mean? And then... Try that there's balloons on the back. It's just doing like some kind of canva. <coughs> Ooh, to, to put his staff on the ground and then he did. Then it turned into a snake. And then he, um. Hey, 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 hey. What's going on in here? What's going on in here? What are you doing? Doing a podcast. Trying to do your podcast? Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Go, go, go. Shoot. He's acting like a little bird. But. <laughs> so, well, what's. Oh, yeah! He picks up two stick, and then. Um. And then he said, What if they still not believe me? So he said, I have one more sign. Because you remember when he said two signs? Now it's one sign. But. And then. This sign was to put your hand in your cloak, and then he did, and then it turned into a disease that looks like snow. And then he said to to put it back in his cloak, and then it was normal, just like mine hand. Mine's always normal. And then he told Pharaoh to let my people go, and then he said, no, I'm not going to do it anymore. Moses did the sign. Well, he put his snake on the ground. And then all of, was it three people? And then all three people had snakes too. But how did they know Jesus? Wait, they actually didn't know Jesus. But how did they know how to do that? Magic. <laughs> the snake ate the other three Name. Oh yeah, I'll talk about the rest, but I'll talk about the rest after this. But today, but right now, I'm gonna um say my new burning bush song, and then I'll talk about the rest. So um, what you but burning bush? That means help to Jesus and God. And then Moses, God made Moses have two plagues. Ten plagues, and and then Pharaoh finally let the people go. Now I'm gonna leave you about the um Bible for um in sixteen nineteen. I want you to be wise as what is good and innocent for things that is evil. Bye bye, guys. Wait, I was just gonna. Talk about the highway furnace. Okay. Bye bye, kids. Oh, my God.
Welcome to the Contact Podcast. Oh yeah, baby. Man, shout out to Landry for getting us started the right way on this episode, going through his personal favorite Bible story of Moses and the burning bush. And if this is your first time checking out the podcast, I'm your host, Donovan Jones. That was my oldest son, Landry. And just a quick piece of advice for any parent that might be listening to this right now. Maybe you're getting ready to have kids or you have kids that are young, you know, two, three years old, and you're trying to figure out a way to integrate scripture into their lives, integrate the things of God into their lives I know for me personally, as someone who grew up in a Christian home, I remember feeling at a certain age, very, very young age, that these stories were getting like growing very stagnant to me and very stale. I felt like they were very old. And it was because they were presented by the same people the same way, told the, the exact same word for word and all of those things. And it just became one of those things that I was like, yeah, I've, I've heard all this. And it made me feel like I had all the answers that I didn't need to get into scripture more because I already know all of these stories, right? And that's a very scary place to be because one thing that I've learned in trying to get into the word more, trying to develop a deeper relationship with Jesus is just how little I know of the scriptures. The more that I read, the more I realize I know nothing. And so we are trying to, like I said, just a piece of advice for any parent out there. This is just something that's been working for us is we have bought three or four different Bible devotion books, Bible story books. And what we're doing is like rotating them. So a couple of days we'll do one book, you know, this week we'll do this book, that kind of thing. And then in the middle of that, we're integrating scripture as well. well right now we're going through the story of Esther in the Bible. And I think as we read scripture to our kids, maybe they don't understand some of the words, but I think when you read from the actual text, what it does, it's going to broaden their vocabulary, broaden their understanding, and hopefully it's going to have them seek out answers for themselves because we tell our kids all the time that there are several things that we need to be in. One of the things is a leader, and a leader is someone who seeks the answers because when people are looking for answers, the leader is, is a leader of the group is going to step in and say, hey, this is the answer to that. Not a know-it-all type, but it's someone that, that has a, a level of uh, respect from other people because of the way they live their life. And I remember the other night we were reading – Uh, the story of Esther with our kids and uh, our oldest daughter, she said, why do we do this every night? Like, why do we read the Bible every night? And I'm like, that is a fantastic question. And I know that, or I feel like, and I could be wrong about this, but I feel like if I would have said that growing up in the household that I was in, it would have been like, hey, why are you acting like that? We need to read the Bible because we read the Bible. This is what we're supposed to do. That kind of, that's not like a good answer for kids. Um, That's not really a good answer for anybody. And I remember growing up in a culture where it felt like we couldn't ask questions. So there's not going to be a whole lot of growth in a place that you can't ask questions because you have all of these questions and nowhere to go to say, well, hey, wh- wh- why do we do this? Why do we do that? So I love the fact that my daughter asked, asked us this. And I said, um, what does Psalm 119.11 say? Because there are several passages of scripture that we've memorized with our kids that they know it. And she says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. And I said, exactly. That's why we read scripture, because scripture tells us how God, who created everything, has designed for us to live our life. That's going to be the best way for us. And also, we're going to learn more about ourselves. And I've said it on here before. The more that we get into Scripture, the more we're going to learn about God, the more we're going to learn about ourselves through the lens of how He sees us. And so it's important that we get into Scripture, especially at a young age, because it's easier to, uh, uh, I guess, absorb some of the content, absorb some of this knowledge. Because as you get older, like the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's hard to memorize these things the older that you get. And so... Uh, trying to get these things like like kids, they got they're like a sponge. They're just trying to soak up all this information, and so um, it's one of those things that I'm glad that she's asking that question, and hopefully uh, we were able to answer that to her the right way in a way that she was able to comprehend. But just to kind of go along with that, there's several passages that I want to look at today because I've had several conversations here recently, and I felt like this was something that I kind of needed to touch on this week because I think a lot of people are carrying a lot of regret, are carrying a lot of struggle, are carrying a lot of things that they have been set free from, but maybe they're still holding the chains. They've got the chains wrapped around their ankles and they're holding the key in their hand and they're like, man, I can't get away from this specific thing. I can't break free of it. And so I just want to kind of promote freedom today. I want to promote 
just the understanding and the truth of this that's very simple. And it's just that there is no additive to what Jesus did on the cross. It's not Jesus plus anything. My pastor talked about this a couple of weeks ago that Christianity is about works. But it's not about our works. It's about the work that Jesus did on the cross. So salvation is a work-based idea, but it's about the work of Jesus on the cross. There's nothing that we could do that could earn our salvation. Isaiah 64, 6 says that even, uh, 64, 6 says even our good deeds are as filthy rags. So does that mean that we shouldn't try to do good things? No, we're going we're to talk about that as we go. But I want to read a scripture real quick, and then we're going to get into our clip of the week. But... The scripture is from Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. And I just want to encourage you, if you're somebody that maybe you have a Bible near you right now, or maybe you can pull up on the version app, app this specific text, I want you to go on there, whether it be in your personal physical Bible or on your phone, and highlight this text. Because if you are a believer, if you have been a Christian for an extended period of time, you are without excuse. This passage is for you. When Jesus ascended into heaven, right before in, in Matthew chapter 28, he tells his disciples to fulfill the Great Commission, which is to go into all the world, preaching the gospel, making disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, doing all of those things. And that is for us to fulfill as well. We have a responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17, it says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, that last text is something that I really want to kind of have this be a through line through this whole episode. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. And right now I want to really speak over you as the listener, the fact that we need to have faith that the price that Christ paid was enough. There's nothing that needs to be added to it. And when we say that we don't trust It'll, it, hopefully I'll be able to explain it more as we go into the episode. I don't want to give all of it away here at the the beginning of the episode. And so let's go ahead and get into our clip of the week, because as I was talking to several different people that had similar uh, context in terms of what we're talking about today, it all was just mixed into a pot. And I felt like God was saying, yeah, we need to talk about this this week. And it went along with this sermon that I was listening to by this guy that I started listening to recently. And I played a, a clip of him a little while back. And I'm going to uh, shamelessly admit right now that I've stolen some of his notes from this episode because this message, I want to encourage you to go check it out. It was called Peace with God. It's by Pastor Jonathan Pocludo, I think is how you say his last name. Uh, he's a pastor of Harris Creek Church in Waco, Texas. So let's check out this. Uh, and it's a little bit of a longer clip. It's about four and a half minutes, but stay with me because there's a lot of gold in there. God is crazy about you, not some future version of you, like not when you do better. Not when you lose weight or you run faster or jump higher or, or make more. Not when you change your, your, you know, relationship status. No, like right now, he's crazy about you. Right now. And there's nothing that you could do to make him love you more. And there's nothing that you could do to make him love you less. And it's so difficult to grasp that. We, we don't have another relationship like that. I mean, even the best parents fall short of per, that kind of perfection love and understanding the grace of god uh, it has tremendous implications for how you live it doesn't give you the freedom to sin it gives you the freedom from sin it, it means that sin doesn't have power over your life it's not a oh no what if something happens it's a thank you god that all my sins have been paid for. We have peace with God. We're free from striving, free from fear, free to live in his abundant life. You, your quiet time does not make God love you more. Your quiet time makes you love God more. Like you do your quiet time so that your affections for God are stirred, but you doing your quiet time, it's not like you get points with him. 
He's not showing you a, a report card at the end of, of this race. You can't change how he feels about you because of how he feels about you is due to his work through his son, Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians 5.19 says it like this, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He's not counting your sins against you. He's not keeping a record of your wrongs. Here's how I explain it. You got a favorite movie, like a movie you watch, you can watch over and over and over and over, you know? You have that, like, man, there's something you watched. Oh, any, what, what is one of those? Notebook, you've seen it a lot of times, right? And so with the notebook, you, um, you can go on the emotional journey you know, it's confusing. So wait, she's married or wait, they were in it. Like, okay. I don't know, but you can go on that emotional journey. Okay. But you're not going to be caught off guard by the Alzheimer's at the end. Right. Sorry. If you haven't seen it, <laughs> like, the, the dementia or whatever's going on, you're not like, Oh, didn't see that coming. Oh man. Right. You can go on the emotional journey, but you like, like you can't be surprised by the plot. God, right, he sees everything you're going to do before you were created. He, you, you know, can you disappoint God? No, because disappointment has to do with expectations. There's nothing that you've ever done that's caught God off guard. So when you're worshiping and with your hands raised and you feel that moment and the Holy Spirit descends on you and you've got tears running through your cheek, like, oh, worship was so good. I was connected. It was just me and Jesus. He still sees prom night and, and he still sees you when you're 62 and you cheated on your taxes. All at wall while your hands are raised. Okay? And, and he says, I love you, not because of what you do, but because of what I've done for you. Oh, man, that, that is very convicting. The, one of the last lines that he said there is, there's times where we have our hands raised in the air. And while we think that this is such a good work that we're doing right now, God must be so proud of me because of how I'm living in this moment, all these quote-unquote good deeds that we might be doing worship or giving to the poor or helping out here, helping out there, or doing all of these things. God sees that, but he also sees us in the moment of struggle, in the moment of struggling with pornography or pain or prom night, like he said, or losing your temper or doing all of these different things. God sees all those things in a moment. One of the main differences between us and everything else in creation is God gives man an opportunity to respond to him. Scripture tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means he knew everything that we were going to do beforehand. And yet he says, I'm still going to bridge that gap. So there's no reason for us to try to add to the gospel or say, yeah, I trust that Jesus died on the cross for me. But in this moment, I feel like he needs to punish me because I've let him down. No, like Pastor JP just said, that has to do with expectations. And Jesus already knows, God already knows the outcome of everything that we've done in our lives. But he's given us that opportunity to respond to him and say, thank you for having that grace. That doesn't mean we go on living in sin, go on doing whatever we want to do. But just to have that understanding of he knew us beforehand and he died for you and he chose you. So we need to live for him and do the best that we can to give, a, give him the best return that we possibly can. But there's a lot of times we as Christians like to live live in a defeatist mentality. We like to live in that place of, oh, woe is me. And one of my favorite pastors, Levi Lusco, he talked about a little while back how there's there's one of those sayings that says, story of my life, you know, and that's, that's always had like a negative connotation to it. So it's like, you get a flat tire on the way to work and you're like, oh man, story of my life, that kind of thing. And you go to your favorite coffee shop and they're like, oh, we ran out of the, the specific coffee flavoring that you want. Or you're like, oh man, story of my life. Or you try to get, take your wife out to dinner and it's raining or whatever. You're like, oh man, story of my life. This is trash. This is just how my life always goes. And he, and Levi Lesko says, we need to flip that and use it as a, in a positive way. Oh, story of my life, I'm redeemed. Story of my life, there is grace for me through the cross. Oh, story of my life, I have been forgiven, set free from these things that have been holding me back from a relationship with a perfect, holy, almighty God. That is the story of our lives. We have been redeemed and chosen because of the price that Jesus paid on the cross for us. We have life. I've been reading through 2 Corinthians, and this passage really stood out, stood out to me. And it's entitled, you know, sometimes whenever you're reading scripture above different paragraphs and stuff, it'll have like a little title for for that section. And this is called Forgive the Sinner. And just to give a little context to this, up to this point uh, here in the chapter, Paul is kind of talking about forgiving people. Obviously, it says forgive the sinner. But I want to look at this, and I read this in a way because 
not to be selfish or turn everything that we read about scripture about us, because it's not, there are things in scripture that are prescriptive and descriptive. Descriptive is just telling us specific things that have happened in the word. Prescriptive are things that are prescribed for us to do. And so it, it's not one of those things that we need to turn anytime we read scripture around to us and say, okay, how does this specifically relate to me? Because I'm the center of the world. Sometimes it's not about us. That's why one thing that, and this is just, this has nothing to do with anything I'm talking about today, but that's one of the reasons why worship is so hard for a lot of people, because it's not about us in that moment. Worship is giving to God the praise that he rightfully deserves. It's so hard for us to do that because the world tells us that we need to love ourselves, that we need to praise ourselves, that we need to glorify ourselves. And worship is taking that spotlight off of us and turning it back to him and saying, God, it's about you in this moment. But 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 just for sake of what we're talking about today, I want you to, as I read this, apply this to yourself in your life, because there's so many of us as Christians, like I said, that are living in this mindset of a defeatist attitude, of a Eeyore, a, oh, woe is me, that kind of thing. He says, and this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 7. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Excessive sorrow. I think sometimes we can do this to ourselves. We can get into a place of, Lord, I'm sorry that I keep failing in this way. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. You know, I use this analogy the other Wednesday night when my, in my class. It's like the relationship with me and my wife where if I do something that makes her mad, right? Like just say, for instance, and my wife is mad at me most of the time. So just take your pick of any of those things. You know what I mean? Any married man out there, you feel where I'm coming from as far as that goes. But just say, for instance, uh, just off the top of my head, my wife says, I leave my clown shoes laying around the house everywhere. Right. And I wear a size 13 and a half. So they're pretty decent sized shoes. Right. But, um, she always says, don't leave your clown shoes laying around the house. And so, um, it's like if I leave my clown shoes out, and my wife trips over them or whatever. And I'm like, hey, I'm really sorry about that. I, I'll make sure I do better about that next time. And then the next day, I'm like, hey, remember yesterday when I left my shoes out and you tripped over them and I told you, I'm really sorry about that. Would you forgive me? And that next day, she might be like, it, it's fine. It's okay. you know. And then three days later, I'm like, hey, you remember five days ago when, when I left my shoes out? I'm so sorry about that. I, just, I can't express to you how sorry I am for that. After a, a while, she's going to be like, dude get over it. Like, it's fine. I already told you that I forgive you for that. Like, I feel like in us doing that, it's almost a sense of false humility because it becomes less about the person that we're apologizing to and more about us because we feel in that moment, I didn't do enough to suffice you giving me forgiveness, even though you've told me that you forgave me. That's a lot of times I think what we do with God. It's like, God, I don't feel like you should have forgiven me for this thing. God, I don't feel like I've done enough to earn your grace, but that's where we're wrong. It has nothing to do with us. It's his finished work on the cross. He sees us in our entirety, and he chose to die for us while we were yet sinners. Sometimes we can unintentionally add to the gospel. We literally add nothing to the equation. It's all about the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And I was reading this passage the other day in Psalms, and it really stood out, stood out to me because as you read this whole chapter, uh, it's not very long. I want to encourage you to do the same. It's, it's chapter 25 of Psalms. Uh, Psalm, I'm sorry. It's one singular Psalm. Many Psalms in the book of Psalm. There's only 22 verses in this chapter, but it's really good because it talks about waiting on God. It talks about allowing God to lead you. And the one that really stood out to me is, is verse number eight. And it says, God, uh, talking about God here, he says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. And then if you go down to verse number 12, it says, who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. So what we can glean from especially verse number eight, where it talks about how he instructs the sinner in his way because of who God is, because of the character of God, he has that love for us that despite our sin, despite of who we are, he will lead us and show us the right way to be. I know for me personally, in my prayer life, I've been praying a lot over scriptures because, you know, I, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, how there was a time and it, it's even still going on right now. And in and, and, and certain times where I'm like, Lord, I don't even know what to pray in this moment. Like, I feel like you're distant from me. And I know that's not you. It's me. Like, I have to do a better job of getting closer to you. Even when I'm doing the same things, there's some things that I guess I need to be exploring deeper and getting 
more into to get closer to you because clearly I'm not exactly where I need to be to feel you. But that's that's the that's the thing that we need to understand too. It's not about how we feel. It's about the things that we know. And he tells us that he will not abandon us, that he will always be with us. Psalms chapter 23, uh, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. You're always with us despite where we are in life, what season we are, uh, how we're feeling. We need to go off of what we know, not what we feel. And because of the character of God, he instructs us and tells us what way we need to go, what way we need to live our life. If we give up that ownership to him, like I said, I'm, I'm praying scripture right now because there are times that I don't know the words to say. And Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 talks about trusting in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And that has been my prayer. Like, Lord, allow me to acknowledge you, not to lean on the things that I think are right or good or the path that I need to take, but to look to you. And that you will direct my path. Scripture tells us that that is the case, that if we acknowledge God in everything that we're doing, he's going to lead our paths. And it takes it a step further here in chapter 25, where it says he instructs the sinners in the way. Each and every one of us right now that's listening to this and me as I'm speaking, we are all qualified for God to lead us because we are all sinners. And so uh, hopefully some of this stuff is making sense. Hopefully it's all coming together the way that I uh, feel like the Lord is telling me to speak on it. But I think just to kind of further go into this, this topic of just, it's not, there's not anything that we bring to the table. There's not anything that we can add to the equation to receive forgiveness from God. There's sometimes we can be prideful in the way that we try to seem humble, if that makes sense. And I'm going to try to explain that through John chapter 13. And we just went through this this past Wednesday night. So if you're in my class and you're watching this or listening to this right now, you've already heard some of this stuff. So you're going to be hearing it a second time. So lucky you. John chapter 13, it talks about Jesus washing his disciples' feet and lowering himself to being a servant in that moment. The book of Luke talks about how in the middle of this Passover that they are observing, the disciples are arguing about which one of them is the greatest. So Jesus, in the middle of them arguing about which one of them is the greatest, he lowers himself, gives the ultimate example of humility, the ultimate example of being a servant and saying, I'm going to wash your feet. When he gets to Simon Peter in verse number six, he says, uh, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. Now I'm going to stop there because one of the commentaries that I read uh, in preparation for that class the other night was it talked about how there's there's a couple ways that we can look at the way that Peter responded. One is it's almost like he showed a false sense of humility in that moment and he almost like expected the other disciples to stop Jesus so when it got to Peter he's like okay since none of these other jokers stop Jesus from doing it I'm going to be the one that does it. Jesus you'll never wash my feet. You're way too good to wash my feet, that false sense of humility in that moment to even maybe take himself in his mind up a level among the other disciples, because he says, you're allowing him to do this. I would never allow Jesus to do this type of thing. But then also the second thing is that, that Jesus, uh, uh, in washing his disciples feet and in lowering himself to that position of a servant in that moment is Peter is saying, almost offended that Jesus would even do this. Like, Jesus, there's no way you, I know who you are. I've seen the things that you do. You're not washing my feet. Like either way, it's like Jesus is saying, in order for you to have a share in what I have for you, you have to take it in this moment. Because sometimes the key to humility is allowing people to bless you, allowing people to do a specific thing for you. Instead of saying, no, I am too great. I don't need any help. I don't need anybody to do a specific thing for me. I could take this back to when I first started. It was very early on. I remember I had a guy, um, shout out to Hector. I don't know if he still listens to this anymore. It's been a couple it's been a while since I've talked to him in a couple of years since this story happened, but he made me a keychain and I don't have it with me, but it, it's the call deck keychain and it's got my logo on there and everything for the podcast. And, um, we were kind of talking back and forth and he's like, what's your address? I want to send this to you. And so he sent me this keychain. It was like a super dope keychain. And I was like, Oh man, I love it. And I still have it. It's all my keys actually for my truck. And, um, I remember I asked him how much it was and he was like, nothing. And he's like, just send me money for the shipping. 
And I was like, nah, man, I, I want to pay you for it. Like it was, you know, this is great quality, like keychain, you know? And he's like, no, no, I just want to bless you. And so he gave me his uh, cash app and I paid him like more. I went on his website and saw how much he was selling the keychains for. And I paid him like more than what he was selling them. And he was like, man, I wanted to bless you in that moment and that kind of thing. And I was like, no, nah, man, I wanted to bless you because you blessed me. It was one of those things. But what I realized taking a step back is like, what I did in that moment was hindered him from receiving a blessing from God. Like I played God in that moment and saying, no, I'm going to be the one that chooses how you are blessed instead of allowing God to bless him for him blessing me, if that makes sense. Because I think a lot of times we see somebody trying to help us and we say, no, you don't need to help me because I can do this. And it, and it could come from maybe a sincere place. But I think what we're not realizing is that, at the end of the day, people that are blessing us, God is going to bless them. Like like in Genesis chapter 18, uh, this is a passage that I, that I go to all the time because I think it's, it's very relevant to this type of conversation. God tells Abraham, I am blessing you to be a blessing to others, right? And so that is like the headship. That is the chain of command. It's like God blesses one person for them to bless somebody else. And God, that, that's it's, it's not going to stop because, again, back to Psalm 23, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Like God is not going to run out of ways to bless us in our life. That doesn't mean that we go around seeking things from God, like in terms of I'm just doing this to receive a blessing. Like that shouldn't be our mindset. But our mindset should be looking. Can I help? OK, how am I going to help? Maybe it's just with prayer. Maybe it's with money. Maybe it's through buying somebody something to eat or giving them a keychain or holding the door for somebody. Be looking for ways to bless people, right? That is That, that should be our mindset uh, at the end of the day. And so again, just to get back to that idea of we don't add anything to the gospel, like the price that Jesus paid, the things that he has forgiven us for, we can't add anything to that to receive the forgiveness because it is already there for us. And this was one of the problems that the churches in Galatia was happening. And this is why Paul wrote this letter to the churches in Galatia, because false teachers were coming in, Judaizers were coming in and trying to get them to come back under the law uh, where they had to be circumcised, where they had to follow the law of Moses and all of those kind of things. And the the way that Paul words this here is he's he says in Galatians chapter one, verse number six, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. He says, I am astonished. I am shocked. I, it's like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, I, I've only been gone for a couple of years from where I helped planted your church, these churches here in Galatia, we don't know exactly how many there are. Scripture tells us, I believe in Acts, it names three or four um, the, from the different commentaries and the research that I've done. There's at least like three to five churches that this letter was supposed to circulate through and things like that. But he's like, I'm shocked. Like, what the heck? It, it's only been a couple of years and you've already turned back to where you're chaining yourself back to something that you're free from. He's like, I'm astonished that you would go back to that. He says, not that there is another gospel in verse number seven, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. In verse number eight, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to a gospel contrary to you, which we preached to you before, let him be accursed. So he's saying like, if somebody comes to you with a different gospel, even if it's an angel, even if it's me and my disciples that are with me, even if it's me and the, the ones that I've been traveling with come to you and try to tell you a different gospel, let us be a curse. Let whoever tries to distort the gospel, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we brought to you the first time. If somebody comes to you and tries to tell you something different, let that person be accursed. Again, it's not Jesus plus anything. It's not Jesus plus whatever that equals salvation. It's not Jesus plus this to receive forgiveness and so not Jesus plus any of those kind of things. Anytime you're trying to add to that, add to the price that Jesus paid, it does two things. One is it puts all of the ownership on you and says, Jesus, I don't trust that the price that you paid on the cross was enough. And that's what that second thing is. It belittles all that Jesus went through on the cross. It belittles the fact that he went through all the persecution and ridicule and, and the, the blood loss and the beatings and the scourgings and all of the things that he went to before even getting, before even being placed on that cross. It belittles all of those things because it's saying in this moment, I trust my emotions and my feelings and what more needs to be done than trusting in his finished work on the cross. And it chains ourselves down to something that we've already been set free from. 
And if you flip over to Galatians chapter 5, just like I talked about at the beginning of the episode, I really want to focus on freedom here. We're free from the, these things. We don't need to wring our hands and say, oh, man, I'm so horrible. I'm so terrible. I'm this disgusting human being. That's not how God sees you. When God looks at you, he sees the price that Jesus paid. He sees the blood that his son spilled on the cross. It's covering you. That's why we like the 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 things that Jesus did on the cross was for our freedom was to bridge that gap. Like he says in John 14, 6, that he is the way. The only way to the father is through the son. He bridged that gap, bridged that 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 chasm that was between a holy God and a sinful man, and he has provided us with freedom. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He says, Look, Paul, I say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. So how can we apply that to what we're talking about today? He says, If you accept circumcision, so what can, how can we apply that? If you accept the fact that it's not enough what Jesus did on the cross, it's we have to add something to it. Christ is of no advantage to us. If we say that what Jesus did on the cross was not enough, Jesus is of no advantage to us. Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. We're free from all of these things. There's no need for you to carry around this chain. There's no need for you to carry around things that you have struggled with in your past. You have been set free from those things. And then if you go uh, deeper into chapter number five and verse number 25, he says, if we live by the spirit, let us also keep in step with the spirit. And so that is the life that I want to encourage you and I want to encourage myself even in this moment to try to strive after because I want everything that Christ has for me in this life. I don't want to take lightly the price that he paid on the cross for us. I want everything that he has for me in this life. I want to take advantage of every single thing that he has, right? And I want to encourage you to do the same. And so hopefully all those things were able to combine together to um, kind of drive home that point of we are free through Jesus. Christianity is based off of work, a single work, which is what Christ did on the cross for us, it has nothing to do with any work that we could do. It's just simply accept the free gift of God through Christ Jesus. I believe it's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 uh, that talks about uh, it's, 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 it's by grace that we are saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And I believe ver chapter, uh, verse number 10 says something along the lines of there are things. And I, let me just flip over there really quickly. Uh, Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. That means that God has things prepared for us to walk into, but first we have to get out of our own head and say, God, I understand it is solely about you, not my feelings, not the way that I feel like you need to be running things. We're not, we're putting ourselves in that captain seat. It's like, God, it's all up to you. I'm trusting you that the things that you have planned for me, the things that you have written for me before time, like it talks about here, beforehand for us to walk in. I'm trusting that the things that you have for me are what's best for me. And I want to walk in those things. And so again, just have a little grace for yourself. Understand that we are all human beings. We're all fallen, but we are free and walk in that freedom, walk in that liberty that Christ has given to you. I love you guys. Uh, again, just to uh, uh, reiterate the fact of something that I've been talking about the last couple of weeks, uh, January will come up pretty quickly. Um, January 25th, I don't remember if I talked about that last week or not. We have the date. Um, I think it was last Sunday that my pastor said that. So uh, yeah, January 25th is the last Saturday in January. We're going to be doing this event for the youth. Um, so yeah, if you can sew into that, uh, whether it be through prayer or financially speaking, it would be greatly appreciated. And I will put my cash app in the show notes, in the description. So it'd be easy to find you just click that link for those of you who have given financially. Um, I thank you so very much. I'm super excited and humbled um, that anybody would trust in this vision that God has given me to try to make an impact on the youth through this event. And Lord willing, we're going to be able to make an impact on whoever's there, not just the youth, but the people that are going to be helping chaperone wise and serving pizza and doing all of those things. And so um, thank you guys for your prayers and all of those things. And so I love you guys. Actually, let me just end this thing with a word of prayer and then we'll get out of here. 
Lord Jesus, I thank you so very much for each and every person that's listening to this under the sound of my voice right now. I pray, Father, that in this moment that they would feel love. I pray, Father, in this moment that they would feel your peace that pat that surpasses all understanding, and they would know in this moment that you love them individually so much that you sent your son to die for them on the cross and help them to just walk in freedom, walk in liberty that you provide. Help them to know in this moment that they don't have to continue living in the things that they are feeling ashamed of or the things that they're feeling guilty of or the things that they're struggling with, that you offer freedom, Father. And I pray that you help them to repent from whatever it is that they might be allowing them from a uh, full and total surrender to you. Even me in this moment, Father, I give up anything in this moment that is hindering me from walking more closely with you and 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 just in a deeper connection and relationship with you i pray that you would re- allow us to just walk fully in the freedom that you provide father and i rebuke anything that's trying to come against my brother or sister to harm them that's listening to this i pray that you would keep satan away from them i pray that you would just shower them with your love and holy spirit just allow them to feel your presence in this moment we love you jesus and it's in jesus name i pray amen love you guys mm-hmm.